Welcome back to the UFO Rabbit Hole Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Chase. In this, the first episode of 2024, I'm welcoming my dear friend, Jay Christopher King, back to the podcast. I know most of you are already familiar with Jay and his work, but for anyone who's new here, Jay is the director of the Experiencer Group and the co-founder of the phenomenal Inquire Anomalous Conference Series in New York City. More recently, Jay and I have teamed up with our friend Jordan Flowers to found a new media company called Ontocalypse Productions. Under that banner, we have already started production on our first docuseries called The Beyond, UFOs and a New Reality. If you haven't seen the trailer for that project yet, you can find that in the episode description. In this episode, Jay and I are sharing our reflections on a new docuseries that was released this week called UFO Revolution, which we both were featured in. The series also stars Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp, David Grush, Chris Sharp, Mike Masters, Richard Dolan, Ryan Graves, Gary Nolan, Avi Loeb, Tim Burchett, and many more. If you haven't seen it yet, this three-part series is available right now on the free streaming service Tubi. You can also find that link in the episode description. So let's get into it. Here's my conversation with Jay Christopher King. Well, hey, friend, welcome back to the podcast. It's so great to see you. Oh, my gosh. It's always great to see you. Thank you for having me back. Well, we have had a very crazy week. It's been a little surreal because a docuseries that we both shot for over the summer, UFO Revolution, that was done by TMZ and Fox and has mm-hmm. been premiering on Tubi, went live this week. And yeah, what a crazy experience that's been. Yeah, it absolutely has been. It, yeah, it's on Tubi, which is this. It's this free streamer that you can get in North America. I think people overseas, generally speaking, need to use a VPN if they want to access it. I also realized that it got uploaded to to Apple TV, I think yesterday. So that's up as well. So if you already have Apple TV, you don't need to download Tubi. But Tubi is this free streamer that you get wherever you download apps for your TV. That's also available on the old laptop, of course. And uh, yeah, three episode docu series. We uh, we were in really good company. It was a fun. Ex- I mean, it was a fun experience to shoot with. I guess we can kind of uh, walk people back through through what this has been like for us because I mean, it's fascinating. I I shot for a few series last year. I know you shot for a few things last year. Of course, we're also shooting our own show, The Beyond, which we can talk about a little bit later. But you know, it it's an interesting experience, and this is the first TV series that I was in front of the camera for that's aired so far. And is the same true for you? Yes. Yeah, it was my first time. I mean, look at us, our, you know, our first time on TV. How did it feel for you? For me, it was pretty amazing. I mean, in a lot of ways. And I thought the docuseries, it it was a lot better overall than, you know, you always hope for the best and you kind of prepare for the worst. And it was very good. I thought it was really well produced. And Overall, you know, I think that it accomplished what it set out to accomplish, you know, I mean, we can all we can always have these ideas of like, what the perfect UFO show should be, or what the perfect anomalous studies, you know, in general, or paranormal show should be. And it's totally subjective, right? But I I think for the tone of Fox or TMZ, considering that it was being kind of like helmed by the, the team of George and Jeremy, you know, as in terms of being like the primary talent for the show, I thought it reflected their work really well. It was kind of like, like an episode of Weaponize, like three episodes of Weaponize on steroids with like a whole fleet of other talking heads, including ourselves. And as such, I totally enjoyed it. What do you think? Yeah, it was a crazy experience. It was really surreal for me, you know, to be on screen, especially with people like George Knapp and even Jeremy Corbell and Mike Masters and all kinds of people mm-hmm. whose work I had followed before I even threw my hat into the ring as a UFO podcaster. And so it felt kind of surreal to see myself in that company. I was really excited with how it turned out. I was a little nervous just because we had filmed back in the summer, early on in August, and it was right after the hearings, at least when I filmed it, but before a lot of the other th- events that took place in the docu series, I think it was right before they went down to Texas to film the Joe Rogan stuff with them. So that was a little intimidating because it's kind of a trust fall. I had felt good about the team when I worked with them and when I talked to them. I wasn't sure what to expect because it was 
TMZ, which I'm mostly familiar with for when I need to, you know, have a palate cleanser of trashy celebrity gossip. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I wasn't really sure, but I was really impressed with their team. And so I decided to to give it a try. But we didn't even know, you and I both didn't know what this docuseries was called, when it was coming out, or even if we had made the final cut until the trailer came out like a week before. And so, you know, we were watching it in real time with everyone else and try and just yep. hoping that it turned out well. And I think we both were... <laughs> very happily surprised and relieved that I think it was really well produced. I think it was thoughtful. I think it was, um, yeah, I, I was proud to be a part of it when all was said and done. Yeah, me too. I completely agree. It, it was challenging to know like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to watch it along with everybody else. And that's, that's typically true for a lot of talking head programs. And I totally understand that the creatives involved in this, the directors, the producers, they need the editors, they need to be able to have the liberty to make their own creative decisions. And as a talking head for a show, you have to know that you're basically, you know, you're creating content for them, and they're going to cut it and use whatever they want. I mean, for me, they shot with me for about three hours, and maybe like eight minutes of that made it into the show. And that's the way it goes, you know. And for me, like, there are purely superficial things, like, for example, that the day that I shot with them, it was the one of the hottest days of the year out here in New Jersey. And we were shooting in an unair conditioned facility and that had like a metal roof. It was like an old warehouse building and it had these pretty windows and it was a beautiful space, but it was also like somewhere in the nineties, you know, Fahrenheit in there. And I was just like melting like a candle like the whole time and their makeup guy had to come and like prop me up and like make me look like a human being again, like every, about every 15 minutes. And so part of it for me, like was like since late August or whatever it was when, when we shot with them, just being like, do I look like a human being? Do I look like a torture victim? Like what's going to happen on the show? <laughs> and it worked out and I'm really glad. And I think that they handled, you know, they were using you and I kind of differently. Like using is maybe a strong word, but like the our utility was a little bit different in this program in that they were like, you were like a real utility player and like kind of moving from one segment to another and kind of introing things and kind of going to you for like a, a little data point as they went into a segment. And that was great. I mean, like that kind of utility player is so needed in talking ad shows like this. And then... And for me, they were primarily looking to me to have a segment and talking about the experiencer group, non-human entity interaction, specifically with Grays, and one of my own situations. The first situation that I had that I can recall involving Grays. And of course, that's like really sensitive subject matter. We're in a weird place with ufology in a lot of ways because, you know, these topics like Grays, abductions, non-human ent entity just encounters in general they were really on the map starting well before close encounters of the third kind but that was in 1977 and that's kind of like for a lot of the populace that was kind of a benchmark year in terms of you know it was one of the first popular depictions of grays though they looked a little wonky but you know jacques Vallée was a consultant for that movie and it was kind of one of the big watershed years for ufology in terms of like the truth or the, you know, truth with a capital T or whatever, the subjective truth of ufology as it's filtered through the media coming into play. You know, at the same time, we've had since then communion, missing time, X-Files, but recently within the last five, five or six years, you know, kind of like around the time that TTSA and like that bombshell 2017, Leslie Kane, Ralph Blumenthal, Helene Cooper article came out. You know, there's been kind of this idea among some of the major players in ufology that we're not supposed to talk about abductions for some reason, or we're not supposed to talk about non-human entity encounters for some reason, and that, that we're supposed to like that, okay, if we're going to do this, it's going to be like this, this kind of like schedule. And it's like, what's that light in the sky? And then two years later, we're like, oh, maybe it's a UFO. And then five years later, we can be like, oh my gosh, maybe they have pilots or something along those lines. And I've been pretty impatient about that. and. I, you know, there's issues there. Like, why could we talk about this on so many shows 30 years ago? And then recently it's become a problem. And so I was kind of sweating it being on that show because in some ways, 
you know, I'm suddenly one of the first people that a lot of people are watching the television are going to see in relation to like a gray encounter or something like that. Uh, because apparently that's been off the menu for some years now. Um, but I'm glad to see that TMZ, Fox, and the producing team stepped up and are willing to kind of like enter a new conversation with regard to these topics. And I'm hopeful that, that that's going to continue as we move forward into 2024. Absolutely. And I agree with you. I think it's really interesting. This like ufology has its own brand of respectability politics where we can talk about craft and we can talk about non-human intelligence in a really vague way up until the point anyone actually interacts with one. And then it's like, oh, don't like if we're telling the family secrets and if you do that, you're somehow hurting the movement or setting us back in some way. And I really push back against that idea. And I want to be transparent about the fact that I've changed my mind on that, that the whole first year of the podcast, I didn't go into experience or stuff at all because I had that mindset. And I want to cop to that, you know, as I'm calling other people out and to say that I was wrong and that I've really changed my mind on that. And I, I don't think that we're, you know, we talk about transparency at all the time in, in terms of disclosure and how important that is. But we're not really being transparent if we're, as you've so eloquently put it in the past, only talking about their Toyotas and not who the drivers are. And, and we're, if we're only giving people one tiny, narrow little picture of what this phenomenon is, then like, what are we even doing here? It doesn't seem smart and it doesn't seem productive just in the name of sparing people a certain level of ontological shock. Like the ontological shock is going to come and it's happening anyways. And so like, let's rip the bandaid and at least have the ontological shock in service of having a conversation that's more holistic and more honest. And, and I just want to give a lot of credit to you, number one, for helping me just through getting to know you and through your friendship, like changing my mind on that. And also for putting yourself out there because I know it's not your favorite thing. I know that like you wouldn't choose like for funsies to put that story out there on such a large platform. And I give you a lot of credit for being willing to do it because you think it's the right thing to do. So just big respect to you for that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's not my favorite thing to do at all. As many people that might follow my work might know, Though I am a public experiencer, I kind of de-emphasize my own experiences sometimes. And it's not because it's not because they're not interesting. I mean, it's just because every time that I talk about that stuff, it becomes the headline. Like, for example, with the show, you know, like the show went well. It was well produced. It was well written. It was well articulated. They handled the topic very respectfully. But look what happened. I, I talked about a lot of the same things that you did. You know, they covered the Grush UAP hearing. I was there at the UAP hearing. They had me walk through that whole experience, my reflections on it, and you know what else was happening that day, things like that. They used absolutely zero of that, you know, and that's fine. That was their own creative decision. And that's totally a hundred percent okay. Um, but what I've found over the years is that you know, in the three-ish years since I kind of came out of the closet as a public experiencer, if one wants to think about it that way, that it becomes the headline every single time that, that it gets mentioned. And that's fine, but there are so many other conversations to have. And I think that when people listen to experiencers, you know, I think listening to experiencers, A, is crucially important. And I'm so glad to hear you talking about that in that way. And, you know, our friendship is so central to my life at this point that it's wonderful to have seen that develop in you and the program and things like along those lines. Um, and one thing, you know, to consider, and this has been a problem with ufology and the paranormal in general, is that experiencers, you know, it doesn't just begin and end with some like scary story that often leads to years of inquiry and deep thought and research. And those questions and those conversations about what happens after the experience and the processing, the integration you know, finding an experiencer that you really vibe with, you're going to have like lots of wonderful conversations potentially because those people have really dug deep into these topics and it's become such a central point of their life that, um, you know, you kind of like get into 
fourth or fifth gear with the subject if, if you start talking to experiencers and start really digging into what those conversations can be. I completely agree. It's great to first listen to experiencers, but I think we also need to be less reductive with experiencers. And there's this weird idea that if you have experienced the phenomenon, that somehow you're no longer objective and that you can't mm -hmm. have any kind of like real opinion or stance on the phenomenon that doesn't have a giant asterisk with it, which is crazy to me. That's like saying, yep. you know, I'm only going to talk to oceanographers who have never seen the ocean. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right, and that's a great example. Sorry, Tim Gallaudet, but yeah, that's a great example. Right. You know, like, um, but I, I think that there that you're absolutely right, and you know, for years there's this idea that we had to have an intermediary that, like, if you were going to think about experiencers, you had to go to somebody that was not an experiencer that has studied experiencers, as if you know they were monkeys in a cage or something like that. And this has been something that's gone on for decades. And there's still a bit of that stigma when you're dealing with some certain researchers who I won't name, but, you know, there are some people that still really think along those lines. And, you know, I think, A, it's amazing that there are so many people that are invested in these topics without having had an experience of their own. I think that's wonderful. I think that it takes a little bit of a leap for a lot of people that haven't had an experience to really go there. And I applaud and commend anybody that has had just a totally by the books, normal life that are fascinated by this topic and really dig in. I, I appreciate all of those folks. And then for the other folks, you know, for the experiencers, it is often something that feels like it needs to be completely ignored to the point that it becomes a problem or it becomes like an obsession that can also be a problem. But, you know, eventually the work happens, you know, the deep thought happens and people can move forward. And some of those and many of those people, of course, with me co-founding the experiencer group, being the director over there, you know, you have like UFO people, anomalous studies people, the researchers and the experiencers themselves. Those are my people. And the fact that I, I am walking into 2024 with such an amazing community of friends like yourself that are around me at all times, it feels like I'm finally winning at life, you know, in a lot of ways to be in this kind of situation. I mean, look at us here we are, you know, and like seeing this docuseries earlier this week, and we were kind of high fiving over that we're working on our own show. And look at this community that we've been developing and your discord community for the UFO rabbit hole. And it's, when we go to conferences these days, it's like we're just hanging out with some of our closest friends. It's really amazing, isn't it? Like, look at this last year and what happened with us. Not just the field in general, but like what happened with you and I. It's it's incredible to think about, you know, the shifts that have happened, not just for the field, but for our lives. It's a really beautiful thing. I think even one of our conversations, maybe even on this podcast, we were talking about how it felt like you and I were coworkers before we ever went into business <laughs> together. <laughs> yeah. You just end up on this kind of parallel path with people who share this passion and this obsession in a way. And I, I was actually chatting on the phone yesterday with Mark von Roppenkamp, journalist yeah. who writes for The Hill. And totally. we were talking about that exact thing. I was like, you know, we talk about the invisible college and it feels like there's this invisible company that we all work for and we're coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> no one hired us, <laughs> but we're all here. <laughs> we hired ourselves, damn it. <laughs> right. But, you know, just like when an experiencer tells their story, that kind of becomes the headline. Inevitably, what really became the headline of this docuseries was the two new UFO videos that came mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. And there is the that kind of jellyfish UAP mm -hmm. and one that they were referring to as the chandelier UAP both because they look like those things. And in some ways, I'm always a little sad to see the conversation get reduced in that way as well to mm -hmm. just the videos when there's so much more going on. But I, I know we've talked about this a lot, but like, what are your thoughts on just UFO videos in general and, and in this docuseries in particular? Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There is so much more meat on the bone for the, the docuseries in general than grainy UFO videos. And that's part of kind of Jeremy Corbell's like signature moves, you know, 
that he receives these videos from his sources and then every once in a while he puts one out he sits on them a lot and then he'll chuck one out there and in this situation he kind of saved two for the show which is great you know it's always nice to have kind of an exclusive or like a new thing and in a series like that that's always a good thing and so it was cool to see it was cool to see both of those videos but i'm just not a ufo video person i think that it's great that you know, Leslie and Ralph, et cetera, and Chris Mellon and Lou, you know, rolled out the classic cockpit videos that took the world by storm about six years ago now. You know, that was helpful for the debate at that point. But since then, with the rise of like AI imagery and video and things like that, and just like how much kind of video and CGI has become attainable by the average person just sitting on their supercomputer smartphone or whatever it becomes a lot harder to kind of gauge like what is a good UFO video? Like what would be like the video that would change minds? And one challenge that I have with a lot of UFO videos, and I wonder if the same is true for you, but you know, it's like a Rorschach drawing a lot. If you want it to be a UFO, it, it can be a UFO. And it, with some of these, they surely are. They surely are UAPs. But if you're not already in the camp of a believe, like a quote unquote believer, whatever that means, but if you're not somebody that's at least open minded to this stuff, most of these grainy UFO videos are not going to be the thing, in my humble opinion, that are going to like push people over the edge and get them across the finish line in terms of understanding that there's a reality to UAP and anomalous phenomena in general. What do you think? No, I agree. I think what it really comes down to is that. In the year of our Lord, 2024, there <laughs> is absolutely no way to either prove or disprove the authenticity of a video. And mm -hmm. so you've got all these debunkers who are like claiming victory and being like, we've debunked it. How? You literally mm -hmm. can't. Unless you mm -hmm. can find the person who faked it and prove that they faked it, there's mm -hmm. actually no way to debunk a video. It's entirely unobjective and absurd, the approach that a lot of them take, where they assume that it's not authentic. And then they will go about like, you'll see Mick West do this all the time. Then they fake one that looks similar. And they're like, it's debunked. That's not <laughs> how science works. That's not no. how yeah. objectivity works. <laughs> Just because you can fake something doesn't mean that the original wasn't real. And you don't get to start with the conclusion that it's not real and then arrange the evidence to support that conclusion and then call yourself objective. Like that's literally not how it works. And somebody, I don't think it was Mick West, but he was certainly reposting it a lot. Somebody was like, oh, it was a Muslim holiday, you know, right around that time. And so probably this is a collection of balloons that's just floating by and then they went and photoshopped a collection of balloons that looked exactly like the shape of this thing. And we're like, right. here, we've done it, you know, which is like finding a collection of random bones and arranging them into the animal <laughs> you want them to be. I, have you ever seen that one where it's like, it's like two long legs and then like a horse head and like a giant. Like, oh, yeah. On top oh, of absolutely. I'll put yeah. that in the episode description for people like that's It's, yeah, the, it's the equivalent do. of what. It's the equivalent <laughs> of what they're doing here, which totally. drives me absolutely insane. But the other thing that really I think we should talk about more is that for a variety of reasons, there's no reason to believe that videos and photos are the best kind of evidence for this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. it, because first of all, if, you're ta if we're talking about something that's potentially, you know, interdimensional, right? Or maybe mm -hmm. something that exists in some kind of a shadow biome that we don't normally see, then mm -hmm. why on earth would we assume that this is something that we're going to be able to catch easily on camera? Like that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Completely agreed. Completely agreed. And you don't have to, right? And, you don't, and, and also, but here's the thing, you don't have to believe that, it's in, that it could be interdimensional or it could be a shadow biome to recognize that it's not good evidence. Because Something I find really interesting is this idea that we have that like seeing is believing or that like visual data is the best data that we can have. 
And I did some research on this, and it actually turns out that this idea that seeing is believing dates back to the Enlightenment. This isn't something mm. that we've always assumed to be true. And it comes from this idea that's very easily and readily disproven that our visual perception is like an objective window into the world and that what we see, that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between what we perceive and what's actually there. And, you know, we've talked about this a ton on the show in terms of, you know, the work of Donald Hoffman and James Madden, and you know, people mm -hmm. can go back and review all of that. But you don't even have to go into the deep science or the deep philosophy to understand this. Like, just go find on the internet some uh, optical illusions and see the ways in which our vision is very, very easily tricked by minor things into seeing things that are not true or not correct. And then when you take that one step further with the fact that not only can our vision be manipulated or tricked very easily, both on purpose or not on purpose, but videos and photos are very easily manipulated, especially nowadays. And so mm -hmm. the idea that like a video or a photo of a UFO is going to in any way ever constitute solid proof of anything is in many ways, I just think a distraction. And I think it's the reason the debunkers stay in that zone because like they can't ever really be proven wrong and they don't ever have to actually engage with the real data. And so I understand, and this was for a more general audience, why a more general audience who's gonna be asking that question because it's the most natural question to ask, like, well, if these are there, then where's the video? But if you think about it just a little bit deeper, it's not actually great evidence. And so I don't even bother with UFO videos. I'll look at one, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll go, huh. <laughs> but that's as far as it goes for me. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. And, you know, I think that it's that classic adage of like, it takes all kinds. And like, I appreciate that Jeremy does what he does, you know, and I appreciate that UFO videos come out because some people are like totally jazzed by them. And like, it, it works for them. And that's great. Um, I'm, as you said, I'm not like a car guy, like I'm not as interested in the vehicles at all. And I don't feel like I have the expertise to really look at videos in a lot of ways. I mean, I went to film school. I've worked in TV for, you know, over a decade. I've produced television. I've sat behind the camera a lot of the time. I've worked with like great equipment. I've looked at a lot of footage of video footage in general over the years. And I am still nothing near an expert at looking at a video like that. And I think that somebody that says that they're an expert about that stuff, they're actually very rare. Everybody can sit and be an armchair expert or have their hot take on something. But there are very few people that are actually qualified to be looking at this kind of stuff, including, you know, the debunkers. And everybody can have their kind of like horse sense or listen to their intuition or whatever. But then at the end of the day, we still have like so much that we can use to fabricate things. And also, it just feels like a dead end conversation so much of the time because somebody chucks a, a video out there and then, you know, 40 to 70 percent of the people are going to say it's one thing and, you know, the opposite are going to say the other. And it just turns into this kind of like pigsty so much of the time in social media. And that's fine. You know, if people want to get heated in that way, and if they want to be investing in the debate in that way, I think it's that's fine. But at the same time, I think it's much more interesting to think about, you know, who are these beings? Where do they come from? What are they doing here? Why are they interested in us? Why are they interested in our planet? And why are they able to evade our system so easily? Why, like with that jellyfish UFO, apparently you couldn't see it with your own eyes. It's only through like heat vision or maybe it was IR. I think it was heat that they could see it like on video. And, you know, that's the case often. Ryan Graves reported similar things like that kind of sphere in a square that he talked about and in other cases like that. They couldn't see with their own eyes. They could only see it through the FLIR, the FLIR, right? And so, you know, I think that that kind of evasion, it gets back to what you were talking about with regarding to being able to hack our perception or being able to evade our perception. 
And that doesn't have to be something that's so magical. You know, there's these debunkers and there are these people entering this conversation that act as if that's like some kind of woo concept that like stealth management is somehow something that is only for wizards or witches or something <laughs> like that. And nothing could be further than the truth. You know, I, I think that there are so many bad actors in this space that kind of like either say that they're are open skeptics or say that they're nuts and bolts people. But at the end of the day, like what's more nuts and bolts than stealth technology? We know it exists. And what's more nuts and bolts than having a freaking pilot sitting in an aircraft? Like, you know what I mean? Like it's yes. basic. It's so it's like, who is that? Just start asking the questions. Stop being fearful. Stop being complacent. Like, let's move the conversation forward. Let's move the conversation back to where it was in 1977 with Jacques Vallée and Steven Spielberg, for Pete's sake. And let's move ahead now in 2024, you know? Like, let's embrace this. Exactly. And, And the other thing, you know, the final thing I'll say about the videos is just, we don't need them. You know, right. you can get rid of every single video that's ever been released, and it in no way compromises the structural integrity of the argument that there's something going on here. Like, you can completely get rid of them, and it doesn't hurt the argument at all. And so I understand why it's important and why people get excited about it. I think it was probably the right move for them to put it in this docuseries, because for a more general audience, they're going to want to see stuff like that. It gets people excited. It plays to the base. But I do hope that we can get to a point where we can have a more nuanced conversation and then just stop feeding the debunking trolls with these kind of Rorschach blot uh, UAPs, as you said. I'm, I'm excited for us to leave that behind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I completely agree with you. And, you know, I think the only caveat before we move on, I think, And like, I don't know if you're going to move towards this, but I would just like to mention the one caveat I have is that we were having, you know, you and I were in a DM chat the other day with Tom Orzachowski from Estimate of the Situation. He, okay, Tom Orzachowski, he's a friend of ours. He lives in New York. He's a writer and he does this great graphic novel that I highly recommend, by the way, Estimate of the Situation. It's kind of a historical take on stuff like Project Blue Book and other historical cases. It's beautiful, great material. And we were talking about like, what would be a good video? Like, is there anything that could be a good video? And he did mention, and I think he's right, that if there was another mass sighting like O'Hare 2006, like over O'Hare Airport in November 2006, there was airline pilots and flight mechanics and people that were like sitting around the gate near there saw a UFO hanging out low over O'Hare Airport for a while and it caused a stir. The FAA refused to get into it. People took some photos of it with the early cell phones that existed at at that point. There's not great footage of it, but there are a lot of reports, anecdotal reports from the time. And there are some recordings from folks right then from air control, I guess, you know, like looking into that. So, you know, if there was another case like that, if there's another mass sighting and we had multiple camera positions and then we also had the takes of the people that were around that 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 could actually move the ball forward a a bit and i do agree about that what do you think about that mass sightings and videos yeah no i agree like or even the phoenix lights there are there is footage of that but it was 1997 so it's kind of hard it's not as clear and it was further up it was higher up in the air in phoenix i believe like much further up than the o'hare sighting which was pretty close to the ground But I think that, and you know what? Something like that could happen. I think what was clear, Mm -hmm. like when we were out at Seoul and listening to Carl Nell speak and that infamous slide about catastrophic disclosure, you know, the the government is afraid of that happening. They definitely see it as a non-zero chance that at some point something like that could happen. And if it does happen, it's almost certainly going to happen because whatever non-human intelligence is behind that has decided that it will happen Um, because it seems to have shown to us that it's pretty good at evading our detection if it wants to. And so the government does seem to see that as a legitimate threat, that that could happen. So who knows? (laughs) Completely agreed. Completely agreed. 
Well, the other major talking point that came out of the series was the inclusion of Bob Lazar in his story in episode three. They didn't go into it too deeply, but definitely, you know, referenced it. Jeremy Corbell has done a lot with Bob Lazar and did a documentary on Bob Lazar several years ago. And I know that he is a believer um, in his story and that a lot of people are. And yeah, I don't know. I get asked about Bob Lazar. It's one of probably in the top 10 questions that I get from people. It's like, what do you think of Bob Lazar? And the truth is, I don't know what I think about Bob Lazar. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about Bob Lazar? Yeah, I agree. I mean, he's a controversial figure. You know, I remember being fascinated by the Lazar case years ago. I think for a lot of people, that's one of the first major cases they hear about, you know, for better or worse, really. And Corbell's documentary is very interesting. And the facts of the case, what we know to be true is fascinating. There's just so much gray area and there's so much of a hall of mirrors when it comes to the Lazar story. He's been very consistent about many aspects of what he recounts from the time. He's a likable person. You know, I think it's his whole kind of persona as this like scientist tinkerer is really fun, you know, and like those old videos of him like hanging out in the desert and stuff like that are pretty cool. And like he's feisty and some of those early blurred interviews that he did and that's fun too and that it became you know with that case that it really kind of propelled area 51 into public consciousness that it propelled george knapp into ufology in general you know that's kind of amazing there's a lot about the kind of late 20th century lore that really developed around that case and there does seem to be like a lot of essential truths to what's going on there. I mean, now through people like David Grush and others, we have a lot of smoke pointing towards a crash retrieval program or multiple crash retrieval programs, either with specific defense contractors or even intel agencies' wings that have been employed to retrieve craft or study craft. We've heard more details about that with regard to, you know, hints towards what Programs like OSAP were actually trying to do maybe in the early 2000s, for example, and what that $22 million would have been actually about, which is, you know, maybe neither here nor there, but it's significant. And people like Marek, who you mentioned earlier, have really kind of tipped the hat towards the idea that a significant amount of the OSAP money might have been towards Bass actually receiving a craft or part of a craft at some point. And that there is maybe like deliberations about a, a transfer from a specific defense contractor. And that's part of that money would have been about, about modernizing and giving the security to a bass facility so that it could receive something like that. I mean, this is really hot information, but it exists, you know, it's out there. And Marx pointed towards that. I haven't investigated that story myself, but there seems to be a lot of heat to that. But anyways, crash retrieval programs, people have said like, oh, we've retrieved craft since maybe the 30s, even before Roswell. You know, there's a lot of stories about stuff like this, that maybe some of those crafts seem to be existing kind of under historical facilities or have been part of archaeological digs. Like some of the stuff might have been around for a long time. And, you know, Bob Lazar's story, like also kind of, he spoke about that. He paid lip service to that. People like Barack Obama even kind of was, he was the first person, I, I believe, to declassify Area 51 in passing by talking about it in conversation, that that kind of declassified that facility. And so we know that there's a fundamental truth to that as well. But, you know, one of the interesting things here is that, you know, I don't know how to make hide nor hair of like the specifics of the case. Like, was Lazar actually inside of a craft? He says he was. You know, and he's a likable person. And there's just a hall of mirrors around this whole situation, given some other things that have come to light. I think he's a fascinating case, but like some other situations that we've been talking about, it's not the smoking gun that people want it to be, but it provides this piece of lore. And this is one thing that we, we were talking about before, Kelly, that, that it's like, this is what ufology often traffics in. And these 
manipulated stories that get used in a way where it's like, why did this story get so much traction? And, you know, there is a strong through line and hypothesis that stories like this often get traction because they kind of have deniability or plausible deniability built into them in some way, shape or form. Like, for example, there's and much is made about how Lazar lied about having a degree from MIT or something along those lines. And, you know, yeah, lying about one's credentials was pretty common before the internet actually took hold. And one could do it a lot easier back then. And if you want to get a pretty high level job somewhere, blowing smoke about what you've done in the past, back in an era where you can do that, you know, I understand the inclination for a young person to try and do that to a degree. Does it make it right? Absolutely not. And, you know, much has been made about that to discredit Lazar's case, which is understandable. It's totally understandable. And at the same time, you know, there are other cases, you know, some of which are kind of too hot for TV in some ways. But, you know, for example, if you don't mind, like, I'd like to mention a case that I that this really, really strongly reminds me of. Uh, oh, yeah, please. There, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm reminded with Lazar, I'm often reminded of actually the Mario Woods case. Now, this happened at Ellsworth Air Force Base back in November 1977. Ellsworth, it's uh, centered, it's north of Rapid City, South Dakota. It's a very rural area, but it actually encompasses this vast, vast area of land and a constellation of facilities in South Dakota. Mario worked as like base security specifically near the nuclear launch facility they have there. At the time, they had about 150 Minuteman II missiles, which is an interesting data point. There's a long-standing documented history, of course, of UAP casing nuclear facilities. So Mario and his partner, Michael Johnson, were on duty. It was about 9.20 at night. Mario's by himself outside. His partner is just inside the door of this facility. Mario looks off to the east at the starry sky, and he sees an anomalous light up there. At first, he thought it was a plane, but Mario quickly noted that this light seemed to only be about 600 feet off the ground at a distance of maybe four and a half miles, which would make this a rather large light at a very low elevation. Mario watched it for a bit and then shined a high-powered searchlight towards this UAP. And he flashed his searchlight on and off, on and off, blinking towards this UAP, and the UAP blinked back. So now Mario's getting more interested, and he's getting more than a little concerned. He also noticed that it didn't seem to be moving at all now. It seemed to be completely still, hovering. So he goes and gets his partner, Michael Johnson, brings him outside, flashes the searchlight again toward the UAP. The UAP light goes out, and there's a long pause. Then the light comes back on, and the craft had moved to the north. They go back and forth, and this happens a few times, and then eventually the light stays off. And so Mario says, he, as he said to me, I've talked to him a few times, Mario says, I guess the show's over, and his partner's like, whatever, not really taking it super seriously. Fast forward to just after midnight, a perimeter alarm goes off. Mario and Michael, due to standard procedure, have to go investigate. As they're driving to investigate, Mario's in the passenger seat of this security pickup truck. He sees it again. And it's big. He said it looked like hot, molten steel. And interestingly, his partner, who's driving, refused to acknowledge it. He just, like, wouldn't go there. Right? So they go around some bins. They can't see it for a bit as they're going around some bins. And there's some natural features that are obscuring it. And then they turn a corner to exactly where the perimeter alarm sent them. And there's this pulsating... According to Mario Woods, there's this pulsating, molten, flaming UAP about 10 feet off the ground, and Mario described it as about the size of a large grocery store, or like a Walmart. The largest thing he's ever seen in the air. Flaming, and he says, glowing like a small sun. He says, somehow, all of a sudden, he's like, I knew it was there for us. I knew it was there for us. There's like this psychic connection, somehow that he describes. And as soon as he thinks that, there's this intense light in the truck with like no source. And we've heard this in other cases that, you know, this was 
talked about, you know, this was shown in Close Encounters. This is shown in other places. This light and it erupts within the truck and he feels like he's getting pulled, like he's getting pulled upward and he's got a seatbelt on, but he's getting pulled upward. He doesn't know what to do. He starts panicking. He flashes his flashlight at the UAP and this like pull stops and it feels like the air comes back into the truck, like kind of a reprieve or something. He looks over at his partner and his partner is just like frozen, like no nothing. He's like trying to get him to move. Like it's as if the guy's like catatonic with his eyes open. Then Mario says his vision goes to like tunnel vision as if he's like starting to kind of pass out for some reason. And then he looks in the side view mirror and walking up or kind of like moving towards the passenger door where he is, he reports that there are three small grays and one tall gray and as everything goes to black he notices that the taller one has clothes on with like a design in the middle of its chest and that one of the smaller ones is pointing this wand at him this like chrome rod and he blacks out okay now this is all he consciously remembers he got regressed and he has he he has a report about that but we can pick that up later for the purposes of recounting the case as we know it. Okay, so he comes to, he hears the radio, somebody's trying to reach out to him, asking for his location. He looks around, and the truck is somewhere else, somewhere he doesn't recognize. The whole truck and he have been moved, seemingly, or he blacked out and the truck went somewhere. He doesn't recognize it. His partner, Michael Johnson, in the driver's seat is still like catatonic with his eyes open. And he sees this big white wall. Mario sees this big white wall. He doesn't know where he is. And he's radioing in. People are like asking about him. And somebody's sent out. Their support sent out. And about 30 minutes later, they show up. And the sun's coming up. He looks at his watch and it's 6.15 a.m. When he blacked out, it was just after 1 a.m. So he's like, what happened? And support says, like, I can't talk to you about it, but we need to get to back. We need to get you back to base. So it turns out during that time, they'd completely disappeared. The truck and them had disappeared. So had the UAP. And security at the base had been on high alert, looking not just for the UAP, but looking for Michael Johnson and Mario Woods and that truck for hours between 1.30 a.m. and dawn. So it's hours later. And it's, a, it's clay roads and snow. And you can see that there were no tire marks going to the truck where it had moved. It was as if it had suddenly been placed there miles away, hours later. So he, get, he and Michael get driven back to the, the launch facility and they're separated. And then they go through a basic debrief. Mario, during that debrief, he goes to the bathroom and he realizes that half of his face looks like it's intensely sunburned. And he goes back and continues the debrief. Then he gets driven to another facility about 55 miles away, like a more central facility for higher ups at Ellsworth, for another debrief with higher level people. And who's at that debrief? Richard Doty. Dun, dun, dun. And, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yes. And Richard Doty, as, as you know, Richard Doty is an infamous disinformation agent. And so there are people in, you know, their military clothes, you know, with their badges on and everything like that, and that are identified and stuff. And then there's Richard Doty hanging out in the back in like civilian clothes. And this is reported often in, in cases, not just with UAPs, by the way, but also with cryptids, which is fascinating. But people will get pulled in for debriefs and then there'll be like one person in civilian clothes, like hanging out in the back, just like sitting and listening. And that's what Richard Doty was doing in this situation. And years later, Mario Woods saw Richard Doty, you know, out in there because he became, of course, fascinated with ufology as almost anybody would in a situation like that. And he was like, that was that, that was that guy. Holy crap. That was that guy. And Richard Doty eventually acknowledged it just a few years ago, which, (laughs) you know, whatever to that, but you know, Books like Greg Bishop's Project Beta have been written about this guy, Richard Doty. And I'm sure, I'm, of course, you know about this guy, right, Kelly? Oh, yeah. And for anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, you can go back and listen to the episode. I believe it's called, it's like Antarctica, Atlantis, and Alien Bases. It's something like that. I think it's maybe episode 12 or 13. And there's a whole story if you want to learn more. 
Totally. And so, okay, so Mario then recounts the story again, and he gets grilled, and it gets put into him with the fear of God that, like, he should never, ever talk about this again. Like, never acknowledge it ever again. Michael Johnson and he both get sent to other bases immediately, like the next day. He never sees Michael Johnson again after that, Mario. Mario gets sent over to Korea, as I recall. He gets sent over to Asia. He gets completely reposted in a different continent. It completely like changes the course of his life. Eventually, he gets a, a job with the Department of Energy at another secure nuclear facility. He's interviewed for it, and clearly the person interviewing him knows about the UAP encounter at Ellsworth and is grilling him about it. And it's like, have you ever seen a UAP? And Mario's like, nope. And like he gets grilled for hours and like he just doesn't, you know, he the fear of God was put into him. He he was told like he should never acknowledge it. And he got the job and he thinks because he didn't acknowledge it. And so he career, you know, he was able to ride out his military career for another 13 years and was able to get retirement on his pension off of denying it while he was in. And while that happened, Richard Doty had planted stories in UFO magazines and he had crucially made the story sound less interesting, that it was kind of just about blinking lights back and forth, that he had changed the date of the encounter and he changed the names, okay? And then the story got planted and then a few months later, word got around that maybe the story was bunk. I wonder how that happened. So then people, some UFO investigators in that era, in the early 80s, they go around and they see if there were any enlisted people by those names at Ellsworth Air Force Base. And of course there wasn't. And so, hooray, congratulations. The Ellsworth UFO encounter of 1977 got thoroughly debunked at that era, right? And Mario Woods right. is still working for the Department of Energy. And eventually he hears about it and he's pissed because like that happened to him. And this mixed up Hall of Mirrors story got put out there and then debunked while he was still had to be mum because of his work. But then after he retired from the Department of Energy, he came out and started talking about the case. Now, this is what happens. So the Lord, there's a kernel of truth. It gets out there and it gets thoroughly kind of like put through a washing machine, right? And some of these stories, they're made to sound more interesting so that people disbelieve them. Some of them are made to sound more mundane so that people are less interested in them. But like this thing happens where, uh, you know, if we change the date and we change the names, it's a common strategy. Then all of a sudden, you know, it can get debunked and we don't have to care about this stuff anymore. And these stories with, sto with plausible deniability are completely rife in the material you know, in the, in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, like so many stories in that era were seem like a lot of people won't even touch them because of how wild disinformation was in that era. And, you know, to a degree, like, I don't know that things are so much different right now. What do you think? No, I completely agree. And thank you for telling that story. People should ask you about more than just your <laughs> your experiences <laughs> you've read a couple books you know um <laughs> but uh no i completely i completely agree and i think that's an incredible example and that's why i say in, in general the kind of hall of mirrors nature of bob lazar's story makes me more inclined to believe that there are kernels of truth there it's just really difficult to know which ones are real and which ones aren't real Yep. And, and, and so it's, it's just, I don't know, it's one of those things where it feels like an, an, an unsolvable riddle. And like you said, there's so much of the UF, the UFO lore that that happens to, I think we're watching it happen in real time this week with the jellyfish UAP uh, video in particular, because it just was dropped, obviously, in the docuseries this week, it's the first time it's been seen publicly. And then you've got you know, people like Stephen Greenstreet, who's like, it only took me 45 minutes to find somebody who can debunk this story. And then that guy, you know, tells him all this stuff and says, oh, but it wasn't actually on this month. It was actually this month. Like you were saying, like the dates are slightly changed and, you know, but then he goes on News Nation to kind of debunk this. But then on News Nation, he says, well, actually, I was a secondhand witness. I, you know, I actually came to this base after 
this video mm -hmm. was taken, you know, and that all of this information is coming to him secondhand. And so now you have enough questions being thrown at this video that its provenance and, you know, reality is like very much in question because there's some data points that don't add up. And for a lot of people, that's like, okay, case closed. It's not real, but this is, it, it's the, it's the playbook that's used over and over and over again. And, you know, Richard Doty has been very open about the fact. And I think this is also common knowledge among people who understand, you know, basic counter intel spy craft and that sort of thing and disinformation that you sew real information in with bunk information. Mm -hmm. For that exact reason, to create this hall of mirrors and to muddy the waters so that people can't tell what is what, which is, for the record, the reason why I would never speak to D Richard Doty. He will never be on my podcast. Honestly, if he walked into a room, I would walk out of it because he's done nothing but sow that kind of chaos within the community. Agree. And I don't and, and he's not the only one. He's just the one that's like narcissistic enough. He's like those serial killers that want to get caught, you know? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. And now he's on X. Now he's on like the former Twitter, you know, and he's like, here I am ready to go. And it's like, seriously? And they'll show up in Twitter spaces and things like that. They'll show up in spaces. And it's like, my God. And people listen to him. I mean, people love a good story. And I understand that. Yeah. I understand that people love a good story. And he weaves interesting stories. There are other people like that, that weave interesting stories. But what people sometimes fail to recognize is that these people have been trained to just completely discombobulate and that like i think that if you listen if you even listen to some of these people like him that at the end of the day like the whole goal is to just not know what end is up and he's very good at it and there are other people that are very good at that they're convincing they're great storytellers Absolutely. and they're also completely fraudulent. And I don't think that we're at the end of that. I don't think we've seen no, our no. last Richard Doty. I think I, no, I like I said, I think we're watching it happen in real time this week. Like I, yep. you can watch it happen <laughs> with this video. It's Absolutely. crazy. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have, you know, people trying to introduce a, like a couple of new characters, you know, to the field. Or people that have even been around for a little bit that have just been sitting and waiting for the moment that um, are ready to try to pull the wool over people's eyes with uh, like a fantastic story that has no basis in reality or has 20% basis in reality. You know, I don't think that we've seen the end of that at all. And I'm concerned and you and I have had private conversations about this, that there's reason to be concerned about situations like that possibly coming into play a little bit more as we get to this kind of critical juncture with capital D disclosure. You think? Yeah, absolutely. I think we should assume that a lot of the narrative that we're getting, even if it's being received by people with really pure intentions, that the entire disclosure narrative is probably booby trapped with little pieces, like little nuggets of information that aren't quite right, or, you know, little tiny things that can kind of cast doubt on the story, and that that's been done intentionally. And in some ways, those things are like time bombs that are just kind of waiting to go off. And I think that we should expect as we get closer to disclosure that we're going to start stumbling on those landmines that were some of them probably set all the way back in 2017 when this first came out. And some of them may have been set decades ago um, mm -hmm. because that's just the nature of how this works. But I think that's all the more reason why, I mean, listen, I'm going to continue to lend my voice and my support for the disclosure movement in the ways that make sense and in the ways that I feel like I can moving forward, because I do think that this is important and I do think it's a fundamental human right that we should understand the nature of our reality and that our government should not be lying to us about things that are this big. But at the same time, I am increasingly disinterested. Like, I'm happy to check in on Twitter and find out, you know, what the latest is. But I assume that the narratives that we're getting through that kind of 
channel around that like very disclosure focused channel is that is not good data. We have every reason in the world to believe that that's not good data. That doesn't mean that there aren't a ton of very well-intentioned ethical people who are just trying to do the right thing. But mm -hmm. when you get too close to this thing, there's this hall of mirrors that emerges and, and that's intentional and you can't sort it out. But the thing that is increasingly clear to me is that Yes, the government might have some craft in a, you know, in a garage somewhere underground. They might even have some bodies and that's cool and all, but they don't own the phenomenon. Like they no. can't, it can't be locked up at Area 51. And that in a lot of ways, fighting for the government to tell the truth is one thing, but understanding the phenomenon is something else. And if you want to get real information and to understand what this thing is better, that can't be where you look for your data. Like you have to look elsewhere. And I'm really excited about what we're going to be doing with our docu-series because we're going to be trying to just completely divorce this. In some ways, ufology needs to be saved from disclosure, which I think is what, you know, you and I are both really passionate about is getting at the heart of the phenomenon and what's actually going on here, you know, stripping away the narratives and the hall of mirrors and all of that and getting down to brass tacks. Like, what can we find out about the nature of our reality such that this could be true? And, you know, what can we learn from experiencers about what's actually going on here? Like, how close can we get to the source? And when, what can we learn there instead of this, you know, this crazy hall of mirrors that we get through the more like government disclosure narrative? I completely agree. I completely agree. And like, to be clear, the strategy that I'm looking at this with was kind of fresh eyes. And I, I don't want to speak for you because you speak for yourself so eloquently. And just from our private conversations, uh, uh, I know that we're on similar tracks this way that I don't want to do this by like going after the defense contractors or going after anything like that at all. Like I'm not interested in you know, when I'm looking for the truth, what I'm looking for are the truth from other experiencers. I'm looking for the truth from books, texts, researchers outside of ufology, even that really cover these topics that look at things like this, like Don Halfman, like you mentioned earlier, you know, that that are kind of adjacent, but highly pertinent to what we're talking about here. Because what I'm interested in, like you are, I think, is you know, the fabric of reality. Like, why is reality so weird? Why is it so different than what we've been told? And who are these various intelligences? And there's a lot of anecdotes. There's a lot of stories out there. There's a ton of accounts. And there's a lot of interesting material there. And you don't even have to blame Washington, D.C. for being itself. You don't have to necessarily blame the Pentagon for doing what its job is. Right. And that's not the hornet's nest that I really care about too much. Sure. I was at the House UAP hearing last year. They're like you. I want to check in on that. I am very interested in how that conversation goes. And also, increasingly, I want to be looking at things from the kind of social sciences standpoint. I want to look at things from outside the military industrial complex. I want to look at, th at things from outside DC because there's so much that we can do as independent people, as citizens, that we can DIY our understanding of the phenomena and the nature of reality in our own ways. All of us can with our own special subsets, our own special skills. And I think that that's more interesting and it's more empowering. And what we're going to be talking about in our docu-series is like looking at independent initiatives, not just academic and startup initiatives, but independent initiatives. Because there's so much happening that has so much potential for the future that does not necessarily rely on us waiting for some politicians to, you know, give us some crumbs or give us something. And I think part of that is that, you know, if you're... And I know that you recognize this, that if you're a hammer, all you see is nails. And so the whole framework that, that has been looked at in terms of nuclear facilities, in terms of military sites and things like that, 
you're only going to see part of part of quote unquote the phenomenon. You're only going to see part of anomalous study that way. You know what I mean? And it's not going to be about synchronicities and like bending spoons and, you know, four foot owls and stuff like that. And it's not going to get at like precognitive dreams. It's not going to get at OBEs. It's not going to get at all the high strangeness that actually occurs in this space. You're not going to get those truths in a hallway in Washington, D.C. or somewhere in Virginia, I think. And I'm so glad to have friends and partners like yourself that feel similarly because I'm not turned off entirely by that conversation. I think it's an interesting conversation, but there are wider conversations to have that I feel like moving forward have a lot more potential overall in terms of like getting to those core questions. I think that's what's so wild about the reality of the phenomenon is that truly this like wildly advanced technology the fact that the government has almost certainly been lying to us for 80 years if not longer and that in essence the history of the 20th century is probably not at all what we thought it was that that is but a small piece of this much greater you know it sounds so big when you say it but in reality it's a very small piece of this much larger reality that we're trying to get at, which is, you know, why we call our company Ontocalypse, because we're not talking about something that's just going to be like shocking. You know, we're talking about something that is obliterating to our understanding of reality and who we are and how we got here. And, you know, I'm interested in the government cover up. I think that it should end. But I also am ready. And I think a lot of people are ready. You know, you and I have calls all the time with our, you know, your community at the Experiencer Group, you know, I've got my Patreon and Discord communities and like, you know, you and I are on calls all the time talking to people and people are ready to move forward. And and something that you and I have talked about and that I was so excited when you said it, you know, that as the director of this thing, that you want to make the choice that like, what if, what if we make a UFO documentary where no one sees an aircraft carrier? And when you said that, I was like, Yes, <laughs> like, please, you know, we, not to disparage any of the other amazing work that's been done and very necessary work that's been done in the field to get people to understand that there's something going on here. But so many of us have been onboarded by that kind of content. And it's like, OK, where do we go from here? Because like I said, like the government doesn't own this. The military doesn't own this. Defense crack contractors don't own this. And we have the ability to approach this ourselves and to figure out what it is. And people are experiencing this in their bedrooms, you know, not just in the cockpits of F-18s. And that we, we should talk about that. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And also, it's, a, it's about outreach. I mean, it, it's completely about outreach because how many people are interested in high strangeness that have had their own encounters, but are completely bummed out thinking about war or the military, especially these days. I mean, come on, look at what's going on around us without getting into it too much. Like the world's a scary place. And like, these are fascinating topics. And there are so many people that, you know, the whole kind of crux of ufology for, you know, since Donald Kehoe has been about like, Who's interested in the paranormal and also com like total backroom military entry? Raise your hand, right? And But there are so many other people out there. There are so many other people out there. And, you know, without kicking the hornet's nest, we can approach so many other people if we kind of not divorce it from that context, but take the parts that work and be able to build a bigger picture for more people. I think that's critically important as we move towards the future. I agree. And I think, you know, my experience with understanding and approaching the like government cover up, disclosure, blah, blah, blah side of it has been a bummer. Like when you really learn about it, like the story you just told about the things that have been done and how this whole thing works, it's very discouraging. It makes you sad. It feels sometimes hopeless, which is actually why I have so much respect for people. I mean, I don't agree with Jeremy Corbell on everything, but like that dude is rolling a boulder uphill 
you know, <laughs> against impossible totally odds. And I wouldn't have the stomach for it. You know what I mean? Not for the threats, not for the fear that I'm sure that he deals with and just fighting. He, it's David and Goliath. You know what I mean? And like, I don't have that in me. I, I just don't. And I find it to be very disillusioning and sad and kind of a bummer in a lot of ways, you know, how far this has gone and how much we've been lied to and what powerful interests are willing to do to all of us in the interest of making money or having power or whatever. Like that stuff sucks. It just does, you know, and we don't need to deny it or, or bury it in the sand somewhere. But my experience of approaching you know, of, of unpacking and understanding my own experiences, of listening to other people and their experiences, to sharing just like the joy and the wonder and the awe that comes along with recognizing how much more there is to our reality than they, we thought that there was. And the way that my own reality has been re-enchanted and that I have found meaning and purpose and community and a kind of like peace and joy that I did not have before. You know what I mean? Like that's what I'm most interested in personally and also what I'm most interested in spreading because I think if you turn on the television, all we have are these fatalistic, depressing messages that tell us that we are small, that we are helpless, that it is hopeless and that things are just going to continue to get worse until we all die, basically. Like that's, that's the narrative <laughs> that we're all being fed 24 seven. And it's like a pressure cooker. And this other stuff is real and it's here and we have access to it and it can give people a reprieve and a way out and some hope. And I I'm far more interested in that than I am in the government cover-up stuff. I'm not here to deny the stuff that bums me out, but I do think that like our thoughts and our intentions matter in very real and tangible ways. And as much as I have nothing but respect for people like Jeremy Corbell who are willing to get into the arena and fight the lion every single day, no matter how many times the lion rips him apart, I, I do think it's still really important that we have this other path as well and that people are given some hope and some release i absolutely agree i absolutely agree i couldn't agree with you more i'm so happy that people have their own strategies you know and i think that that's like jeremy or george or ross or ralph or leslie or like many other people there there are so many people that have their own approach to how to get this information out whatever it is and you know, we need more, we need more. And I think by taking the approach that we're going for in terms of inspiring people to kind of like look at what they can do, you know, ask not what anomalous studies can do for you, maybe ask what you can do for anomalous studies, right? Maybe ask what you can do for exactly. ecology, you know? And being able to look at that approach uh, on an individual level, I think in an open-minded, non-judgmental, in non-prescriptive way, you know, that can move mountains because, you know, I think that like recognizing and showing people that they have the keys to their own cars is going to push the ball much further. And I believe that we're capable of that. I know that we're capable of that. And I know that other people are as well. And I think that looking forward, especially when we see how much is outside of our control, in 2024, that recognizing that there are aspects that we're in control of and the, the, there are things that we can do on individual levels, that's going to be a refreshing mindset for a lot of folks. And I appreciate that quite, quite a lot. Well, and I think it's so wonderful and we're so grateful, I know both of us are, that we have Jeff Kripal coming on to our project as a consulting producer because I think that we're very aligned in that way with Jeff. So much of his work, you know, about supernatural and the superhumanities and, and all of that is really pointing to this idea that we have forgotten and denied in many ways some of the most interesting and important and vital things about being a human and that we are more powerful 
and more interesting than we tend to think. And I think that that message, we're not just burying our heads in the sand. I really do think that this line of inquiry really can offer us a way out. Because if this world is ever going to change, if we're ever going to, you know, release the pressure in the pressure cooker, if things are ever, the pendulum is ever going to swing back the other way from just like bad, 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 you know, <laughs> that people have to believe that it can. You know, because if we don't believe that it can, we're all just going to sit in our house and watch TV. Like what? Because why not? Like, what else are you going to do? You know, but if people start to see themselves and their fellow humans differently and to see that we're more interconnected that we, than we thought and that we're capable of more than we thought, I think that that's actually a really powerful remedy that the world really needs right now. And I don't think that, you know, you and I with our, our little docu-series are going to save the world. But if I'm going to wake up every day and put, you know, a certain amount of the hours of my life towards something, that's the thing that I want to put the hours of my life towards. I completely agree. I completely agree. And even just in the few days since this show started airing uh, UFO Revolution on Tubi and now on Apple TV as well, that I've gotten great messages. Sometimes I don't know how people find my number or my email address. And sometimes that's a little concerning. But like I get great messages from folks. And I, and I see that, you know, it's awesome to hear how it's our, people have already been sending it to their relatives or their loved ones or that it's open conversations for them. And that's already been happening. And like, they flashed the Experiencer Group landing page in the docuseries and it said the Experiencer Group on my Chiron through the episodes. And I was really appreciative of that because even just in the last couple of days, we've had over 50 new vetted members of the Experiencer Group come in that already like went through the application process and things like that. And, you know, seeing the applications and seeing what people wrote, you know, seeing the impact that material like UFO Revolution can have. I'm very hopeful for what we're doing with the beyond and what we're doing with our other upcoming projects through Ontocalypse and what other people in the community are doing as well. I am very optimistic about 2024, despite some unique and very present challenges. I couldn't agree more. 